So, um, good morning, bienvenue tout le monde. You are all very welcome. I hope you are all well and safe. My name is Cleo McGowan. I am the director of the France Island Chamber of Commerce, which is a membership organization of over 170 key companies who are players in the Franco-Irish business world uh, based here in Ireland. Today, it's, this is a seminar and one of a series of webinars that we are organizing to help keep our members and the friends of the chamber up to date on best practice for COVID-19. Today, I'd like to thank our patron, Mazars, for sponsoring this event and providing two of the speakers, and also our other patron, Transdev, for joining us on our panel of speakers to bring us up to date on what is happening on the Lewis. So we look forward to hearing about the HR employment issues facing employers when reopening their workplace and how the Lewis continues to operate during lockdown. We are going to have two presentations, first of all, uh, and I'll introduce the speakers before I do. During the presentations, you will have an opportunity to ask a question which we will endeavour to answer during the Q&A part at the end of the presentations. In order to ask, ask a question, you type into the button which says questions, or there's also a chat button up on the right of the panel. And if you send that in, we will try to answer your question at the end of the presentations. The presentations will take about 30 minutes, and then later we will move into a Q&A panel. So moving on to the speakers, I'd like to introduce first of all, Dara McLaughlin from Mazars, and Dara is head of Mazars Consulting in Ireland. Daria is also a fluent French speaker, very apt, but we won't be doing the presentations today in French. And she has worked extensively with the international arm of Mazars Group in the USA, the France, UK, Eastern Europe, and has lived and worked in Paris. The other speaker this morning is Sonia Boyce, also from Mazars. And Sonia is a director of Mazars Consulting and leads the HR and Consulting Organization Development Service Line. She leads the team that delivers a range of HR consulting services to clients across the public and private sector. And finally, we're very happy to invite Miri Egan to join us for the panel discussion. And Miri is head of HR for Transdev Dublin Light Rail. The company has restructured and grown in size over the past few months. And Miri is heavily focused on leadership development, business planning, organizational development, employee engagement and industrial relations. So we have a great panel of speakers. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And now I'm going to pass over to Dara McLaughlin, who will lead with the first presentation. Over to you, Dara. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. We're just going to turn off our webcams to allow you to see the slides and we'll turn them back on again for the, the Q&A at, at the end. So hopefully everybody can see um, the slides on the screen now. Um, so look, I suppose we're we're all confronted at the moment with a situation that we that was effectively unimaginable a number of months ago. The COVID nineteen pandemic has impacted really severely on every part of our society and on our economy, and it's probably the biggest economic challenge we've encountered in decades, bigger than the last recession, most probably, and I think probably all of us. This morning can attest to the fact that most of our businesses and most of our staff have really struggled under its pressure. So now that the initial phase has passed, um, what do we do about returning to our offices? What do we do about returning to our workplaces? And can we ever really get back to what we used to call normal? So this morning, we're going to try and help you answer those questions. And we're going to focus on how you might plan a return to work, what your obligations are in planning a return, what you need to do to protect yourself as an employer, what you need to do if you're an employee to protect yourself and what you need to consider in developing an implementation plan. We've split it into two components, as you can see in the slide. So I'm going to cover off the first bit, sort of the, the background, the context um, and so on, your obligations uh, in, in returning to the workplace. And my colleague Sonia is going to talk you through all the various elements of practical implementation. And there are quite a number um, that you need to consider. And she'll particularly focus on the people side of the plan. We'll just move on to the next slide, slide there. So I suppose maybe we just thought it would be helpful to start with um, the decision makers. We've all been listening to the news and we've heard, um, uh, I suppose, we've become very familiar in recent months, I suppose, with a range of public sector bodies 
that some of us probably never even knew existed. And they are very much calling the shots and dictating what we can do at the moment in relation to our business lives. So in the middle there in the red are all the science uh, led organizations, in particularly the National Public Health Emergency Response Team, which is which is the team responsible for monitoring the virus and providing advice to government and to state agencies, including the HSE. Um, it's a group within the Department of Health and it was convened specifically to respond to COVID-19. Um, and what it does is it holds its meetings and sends a letter to the Taoiseach and letters to the, the Minister for Health at the end of every uh, meeting. Um, and it's, a, it's advised by the European Centre for Disease Control and an expert advisory group, um, an Irish one. Then you have, I suppose, the um, Health and Safety Authority who are responsible with the HSE for developing one of the things we're going to talk about this morning, uh, which is the return to work safety protocol. Um, the Department of Health, Health is very much driving this uh, with the HSE. They have consulted on a, uh, an organization, which you'll see on the right hand side, they're called LEAF, the Labour Employer Economic Forum, which is a forum made up of government, trade union and employer representative organizations on what's practical in terms of returning to work. Um, the Health and Safety Authority occupies quite an important role because they're responsible for monitoring and for enforcing compliance. Um, and they can they can potentially shut us down in the event that we don't properly comply with some of the, the provisions. We'll talk about those and their role a little bit later. But just moving on to the next slide then. Effectively, we've been provided with a framework um, by these decision makers. So it's effectively, it's, it's like a toolkit or a framework which includes recommendations and in some cases obligations as to what we need to do, but it doesn't necessarily provide all of the answers because in many cases uh, the elements are still evolving as the health situation evolves. So I'm just going to talk you through each of the elements of this framework so you can get an understanding of what your obligations are. So on the left hand side of the screen you'll see a blue icon effectively which is um, the roadmap. You'll have heard a lot about the roadmap. Um, was published on the 1st of May um, and it's called the Roadmap for Reopening Society and Business and it sets out really a plan across a timeline as to when restrictions will be lifted. So it provides for five phases starting last Monday the 18th of May and working up to the 10th of August and effectively it sets out timelines for opening up. We'll talk more about that shortly. It's effectively a big picture document uh, and a target timetable. Secondly you'll see in the under the over the red red bar you'll see the return to work safety protocol um, it's probably the most important document from the perspective of any business uh, because it's a set of guidelines and measures that were developed by the health and safety authority and the hsc and they apply to all organizations um, it's been called a living document because it, it's it's envisaged that it will be supplemented over time Thirdly, down in the right hand corner there's a document that you'll see a yellow and blue one which has been published by the nsai it's a very helpful document, a set of guidelines to help organizations protect against and respond to COVID-19 disruptions. Um, it sets out practical measures for uh, business continuity risk and, and, and management of site recovery. And we'll talk about that later. And then there are two pieces of legislation which are key to um, the returning to work. The first is the Health Act 1947, which has been supplemented or amended recently to include an additional provision um, and it's really designed to slow the spread or minimise the spread um, and address public health risks. And it's, a, it's policed by the, 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 the Gardner Ship Honour, we'll talk about that later. And then the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act, which is the act that is used by the HSA, the Health and Safety Authority. Um, it's, there, it's an existing act um, for, policing, um, for policing the protocol and for policing how we all implement the safety measures. So that's, there are effectively those five components on the framework. So let's start with the roadmap. You'll see in the right-hand corner of the roadmap, the, the image there of the roadmap. So it's 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 a five-phased approach. The phases are across the top there, and then down the left-hand side are the different elements of the phases. But we're going to focus specifically on the economic activity and work one, which is most relevant for us. So it sets out a number of things. So it, it, it provides a sequence of actions effectively and a timetable. It also provides a decision-making framework for government. So how do I progress from stage one to stage two? What are the key indicators that I need to meet? It sets out a process for engaging with unions and employers. Um, and it sets out some other measures in relation to economic policy and societal concerns. But the, I suppose it's driven really by the fact that it's staggered under three week phases. So each phase should progress in three weeks um, on the advice of NFET. 
um, and they may or may not progress. It has it, the stream that's focused on economic activity and work acknowledges that we're in a difficult situation. So that our our GDP is projected to fall by 10.5% in 2020, which will result in a deficit of about 7.5% of GDP, which is very large for us, and a further large deficit in 2021. Employment is expected to reach a peak of 22% the second quarter of 2020, uh, and hopefully falling gradually thereafter. At the moment, there are close to a million people dependent in some way, form or other on state aid. Um, which is really enormous out of a workforce of two and a half million. So this roadmap is essentially designed to try and address those issues, those significant economic issues, and provide for a roadmap to opening up. But it's a very long roadmap. Um, and it, the, the roadmap is designed to sit along uh, all of the various different supports that you'll be familiar with that the government's put in place. Um, so the pandemic payment and the wage subsidy scheme and so on. And there are a number of SME um, schemes that we understand are due to be um, announced shortly. So the current advice under the roadmap is that anyone who can work from home should continue to do so. You'll have noted from the 18th of May, the first phase of the opening up was uh, activated. And that effectively allowed for uh, outdoor workers to begin to return to work. So construction workers, gardeners and so on. So employees are advised to, uh, employees are advised to apply the safety and work protocol which I'm going to talk in a second when they are opening up. Um, and if you're bringing staff back before the 10th of August, you are really designed, you really requested to kind of do a risk assessment and make sure you address the health risks associated with that. We'll talk to you about that later on. Um, there's a lot of work involved in that, but it includes things like cleaning schedules and waste disposal arrangements and, and so on. So in terms of what's planned for each phase, we're in we're in phase, we're approaching phase two, I suppose. And this allows um, people who can work safely while maintaining a two meter distance for to work. So that might be, for example, people who work on their own, loan workers. Um, and the Health and Safety Authority has a definition of loan workers. So uh, it's those who work by themselves and don't need close supervision. So that could be uh, somebody working on their own in an office. It could be, for example, the HSE has defined people who work in an x-ray department or in a, in a isolation uh, care unit. Uh, that kind of thing, as people who can be defined as loan workers. In phase two, which is st hopefully starting shortly, we are all obliged as well as employers or as businesses to start working on our plans, our, our COVID-19 return plans. So we should factor into those things like social distancing compliance, hygiene and cleaning, compliance in relation to higher risk situations, high risk staff or high risk environments, plans for medically vulnerable people or pregnant people and extended opening hours or shift work to enable social distancing. But apart from the lone worker situation, phase two provides for everybody else to continue to, to work in a remote fashion if they, can, if they can do so. Phase three then comes into effect on the 29th of June and it provides for organisations to open up where employees have low levels of daily interaction um, and remote working for everybody else. Phase four then is the 20th of July, and employees who cannot work remotely are considered first for return to work, to on-site working. So, for example, hairdressers. So I think the ladies amongst us will probably be very glad to hear, and maybe some gentlemen also, that uh, you only have to wait until July uh, before you can visit your hairdresser or your barber. Um, so it also provides for certain types of businesses uh, that can uh, work in shifts or uh, apply staggered hours that can be implemented. So, for example, you could have man in certain manufacturing uh, company settings where you can apply a 24-hour work period or something. But apart from that, again, remote working applies. The final phase, then, or the fifth phase, which commences on the 10th of August, depending on the advice of NFET, envisages that everybody will have done their COVID-19 plan that we talked about in a moment ago, we'll talk about again in more detail. Everybody will have adapted their workplaces, which again, we'll talk about, and uh, their policies and train their staff and there are requirements for us all to do all of those things which I'll talk to you about shortly and then based on that based on having done that the 10th of August effectively is the start date for a phased return to work across all sectors however if there are certain if there are certain high-risk organizations so for example a call center where you can't easily maintain social distancing then a specific plan is put in place so in effect the roadmap gives us an overall timeline 
for returning to work. But it effectively is also saying that remote working should continue for most working workers and businesses where they can do so, except where it's explicitly provided. So that's the first part of the framework, the roadmap. We'll just move on to the second slide, the next slide now, and look at the protocol. This is probably the most important document. If you were to read anything, I would I would say read this. Um, it really gives you quite detailed guidance on what to do, and also sets out your obligations, and there are obligations that you're required to comply with. So it's a set of guidelines, effectively, developed by the Health and Safety Authority and the HSE. It applies to all organisations, all sectors, um, and it's envisaged that it might be supplemented over time as the advice changes. Um, so because of that, it's been called the living document. So employers are advised to consult it and put, um, I suppose, practices in place before they bring employees back. So in advance of recalling your, your workforce in any significant fashion, this is the document to consult, which sets out what you have to do. Um, it, it, it provides for a minimum standard. So it's not suggesting you can't do more, but it's saying this is the baseline as to what you must do. Compliance is going to be enforced by the Health and Safety Authority using their existing powers. Um, those powers include inspection powers, they can issue an improvement notice or they can issue a pro prohibition notice, which means you work must cease. Um, and they have quite significant penalties, so they can, which include criminal sanctions, sanctions for employers and senior management and fines up to three million. So quite, quite hefty if they, if they do enforce. Um, now, on the flip side, the CEO of the HSA has said that if workplaces can't put the measures in place, they shouldn't reopen until they're assured that they're in a position to protect workers protect customers and protect clients. Let's go up in the protocol. So I'm just going to talk to you shortly about developing a practical plan to implement the protocol. But at a, at a very high level, I just want to tell you what's in it. Um, so it sets out provisions for a COVID-19 response plan. How do I address all of the measures that I need to? It sets out provisions for specific policy and procedures, uh, either new policies and procedures or ones that need to be adopted. adopted. Uh, an approach to consulting uh, your staff, um, or an approach to implementing specific hand measure, uh, hygiene measures, even hand hygiene has specific elements of, for hand hygiene and so on. It, it talks about the role of an employer, what an employer must do, what a worker must do in terms of complying with the protocol. So it's not just the employer's role, it's also the, the worker or the employee's role. It sets that occupational health and safety measure. And interestingly, it even, it even goes into Legionnaire's disease because it's saying, so all of our air conditioning systems and heating systems have probably been switched off for quite some time. So are there other risks that might emerge, such as Legionnaire's disease? Um, it provides advice for uh, a range of different options in terms of um, different types of businesses and resources and so on. Uh, it's a very useful, informative document, but it does set out a series of mandatory obligations. And these are the ones I think to zone in on. Um, so you, an organization must appoint at least one worker representative who will work with the employer and make sure that the measures set out in the protocol are adhered to. It also says that before you open your workplace, you must conduct induction training, which is tricky in some environments where people don't have access to online facilities, but it's, it's providing that you must conduct induction training for workers to make sure that they know what they're supposed to do. So what are the hygiene measures they're supposed to implement? How do your how have your policies changed? How are you going to enforce social distancing? Can they use the canteen? Can they use the lifts? And so on. All employers must issue a, re a return to work form. Uh, and there are examples of the forms in some of the documents that we'll talk about. Um, and all, em all workers, all employees must complete them at least three days before they come into the office, come back to work. Um, if you have a safety plan, and not all, not all organizations have a safety plan, but depending on the industry, if you have a safety plan, you must update it. Um, it should include measures for social distancing, provision of hand sanitizers, provides for things like tissues, clinical waste bags, procedures around hand washing, all of these kind of things, ventilation and so on. In fact, it even says you shouldn't probably put on your, your, um, your air conditioning system, for example. It provides for the fact that employers must keep a log of any group work which to facilitate contract tracing um, in the event that a case emerges or a suspected case emerges, it's a quite specific provisions on what you do and how you address that or a response plan. It says it provides for somebody coming to the office and then displaying uh, symptoms during work hours. So it, it, what, what must you do? You know, you must bring them to a designated isolation place, you bring them in a designated route, um, you must keep some major distance away from them. They must be in isolation for a period of time. You need to arrange them to go home. However, they can't go home and call you. So it's quite specific. It provides break periods and rest periods. Um, 
And then in the event of two weeks, I had certain provisions like glass bars and sneeze guards and so on. So it's very comprehensive, it's very specific, and it's quite, quite, quite practical. And Sonia will talk to you a little bit later on how to implement it in, in more detail. So that's the second element of the framework, and probably the most important one. So we've had the roadmap, uh, the protocol, um, and the Health Act 1947, which has been amended, is, is the next one, the third piece of the framework. Um, so it was introduced effectively to police the roadmap. So as restrictions are reduced and, and, and pulled back, the on Garda Shea has the power to enforce restrictions uh, set out in the roadmap. It's currently in place until the 8th of June, but it's likely to be extended. Um, it, it's aimed more at individuals and employers, but it's effectively particularly focusing on travel. So uh, to avoid an unnecessary journeys and so on. And uh, there's a fine, there's a fine of two, two and a half grand and up to six months imprisonment if you if you breach it. We're not actually aware of any employers that are being prosecuted at the moment, but um, but the provisions are there. So I think it's important as well in the context of that piece of legislation to look at whether you as an organization are on the essential services list. Because if, if you are on the essential services list, then your employees may travel beyond the restrictions to carry out their work if they have a reasonable reason to do so. So for example, um, Mazars is, as an accountancy firm is actually deemed an essential service and we're permitted in certain circumstances to travel beyond the restrictions. So, it, for example, what we're doing at the moment is we're providing staff with a letter that they can show to Embargo Sheep on it if, if they need to, to come to the office or go outside of their uh, five kilometre uh, restriction. So that's the third element of the framework. The fourth element then is the effectively the enforcement of the protocol. So it's the Sa Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act 2005. So it's 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 how the Health and Safety Act will enforce the protocol. Um, so they can inspect us. They can issue improve an improvement notice. Please address the issues that we've noted. A pro prohibition notice. So um, you're going to have to close in for a period of time. Um, employers, regardless of the protocol, are required to protect their employees, and they're required under this piece of legislation to ensure the safety and health and welfare of their employees. So they already have these powers effectively, but they now are implementing them in a different context. And there are four kind of bits of legislation which are relevant. The first bit is to do with employers' duties. The second, employees' duties. The third, section 27, protects an employee. So it means that if you have an employee who is concerned about returning to the office and you're trying to get them to, to come back, um, they can claim well, under section 27. And that is actually a concern because um, you, you may have a situation when you get to the 10th of, of August where the, 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 the worried well, so people who are fine but nervous, will consider using that piece of legislation. So it's an important thing to, to look at. And then you have provisions for, for penalties for breaches of legislation. So the min, you might say, how are they going to Im, implement it? Because there's been a lot of discussion in the press um, about the HSA and their resources. Uh, and they've allocated 67 inspectors to this to this area, so it's unclear what level of inspection can actually take place. But the Minister for Business, Heather Humphreys, has said that in the first instance, what the HSA will do is uh, is provide advice and support to employers on how how they should implement the, the protocol. Um, and they will be able to visit the work the workplace. You can have whistleblowers and so on, uh, and they can issue a report of inspection, and that that's given to the employer at the end of the visit. And then it includes timelines and follow-ups and so on. So the general thinking is that that will be the first port of call, that they'll visit a workplace and they'll leave a report. And then it's only when issues of non-implementation non occur, they may uh, invoke their powers. But nonetheless, they're quite important powers with fines of up to three million and criminal sanctions. The final piece of the framework uh, that I wanted to talk about today are the NSAI guidelines. So. The NSA, you'll know, is the National Standards Authority. Um, it's issued a set of guidelines which are, I, I find certainly really helpful. Um, technically, initially they developed them for the retail sector, but actually they really apply to all sectors. Uh, they're not mandatory or anything, they're just helpful because they include things like checklists and templates. So ranging from uh, visitor and contractor questionnaires to suggestions on how you might zone your workplace, um, what do you do with a suspected case, how you do effective cleaning and so on. I think it's probably well worth a read as well as the protocol. So in summary, the overall framework that we've been provided with sets out a roadmap, which is which is all of the timelines and the measures that's policed by Angarda Shea a protocol, which is the detailed uh, obligations for employers and employees, 
and probably the most important element of the framework, and that's policed by the Health and Safety Authority. Two specific pieces of legislation, Health Act 1947, which is what's used by the, on Garda Shekona to police the roadmap, and the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act, which is what, what's used by the Health and Safety Authority, which will be used by the Health and Safety Authority to police the protocol. And then the guidelines, the NSAI guidelines, which are practical guidelines. So, I guess just to finish up on my side of the house, what can we do now? So there's a lot for you to think about as an employee or an employer in reopening your business. But some of the specific things you could do now, as of the 27th of May, are determining firstly what category of organisation you fit into, and then what phase of the roadmap applies to you. So when can I start to implement my return to the workplace? Also, prepare a COVID response plan. That's required under the protocol from the 8th of June, so you should start, can start getting, uh, getting to grips with it now. If you have any staff that are, if you are in, I suppose the category of, of organisation that falls into phase five, and if you need any staff member to return to the August before to return to the office before the tenth of August, make sure you have a clear paper trail and document your rationale for the decision, so you can support your decision. And in that instance, check with your insurance provider as to levels of cover, because that would be a concern you would have in the event that you're effectively stepping a little bit outside the protocol. Are you covered from an insurance perspective? Ensure that you are aware of all of the elements in the return to work safety protocol and adhere to it. Make sure you have an implementation plan and that's quite quite a piece of work because it's everything from reconfiguring the office to cleaning to uh, training your staff to policies. Making sure you have a new, a full, a full communication plan and training plan that you must put in place before you bring staff in back to the office. Um, and if you need to have flexibility for certain employees, maybe go and look at the specific cases that would be unusual. Um, high risk employees or employees that require flexibility and come up with a specific plan for them. And if you can, try and provide for the fact that it's, if possible, as few staff as possible should return to the, the office if you fall into phase five before the 10th of August. And then really keep the plan under review because it's envisaged that all of these documents will be supplemented in the period between now and the 10th of August. Okay, so Simon is going to bring us through some of the specific issues um, to address while you're implementing all of the measures that I've just mentioned. Great. Okay, so thank you, Dara, for that comprehensive overview. So just turning now to look at some of the practical considerations for employers around implementation of the protocol. Firstly, as we have said, um, it is important to stress that the protocol is a live document, so may well be subject to change over the coming weeks and months. But in terms of the key considerations um, for employers at this juncture, for today's um, purposes, I have broken our presentation into a number of different areas. So firstly, looking at the physical workplace considerations um, and the, the four broad areas there. So looking at the physical workplace considerations, the health and safety considerations, general staff considerations, and then a category which I've named as other, which includes sort of issues around legal issues, insurance issues, public transport issues, and general HR policy issues. In terms of the first area here, so the physical workplace considerations, Turning to look at this, as we know, employers in Ireland have a long-standing suite of legal duties under our existing health and safety legislation. And this includes a duty to protect the health and safety of all employees, as well as those members of the public, service users, and general contractors as well. So we know, I suppose, from the current context and when considering the appropriate steps in relation to opening and reopening of business premises. I would urge now all employers to consider firstly the access to the workplace and how that can be best facilitated. In terms of that access, what we're looking at here, I suppose, is really around the clear guidelines in terms of who can access the workplace, including staff, contractors, customers, visitors, and also how employers can go about adapting their workplaces to facilitate social distancing. Helpful measures here may also include things like, for example, removing every second office chair or introducing screens and physical partitions where possible, or closing or significantly reducing access to areas um, that are used in, in publicly, such as, for example, you know, uh, um, canteen areas and tea stations, and also significantly reducing access to meeting rooms and continuing to facilitate meetings virtually where possible. 
It is also going to be necessary to minimise the number of staff in the workplace at any one time. So employers do need to be focused on striking that balance between allowing employees back to work um, and continuing to maintain social distancing. Helpful measures here might include things like, for example, staggering employees return um, to work, whereby you would have half of your employees attending the workplace for, say, you know, two to three days per week, or on a week in or week out basis, whilst others, your your other half of your teams continue to work remotely, and then you would rotate those teams. But as we can see, for many workplaces, it will not be possible to return to full capacity for quite some time. In relation to the layout of your workspace, the practice of zoning is something we have seen work very well um, in other jurisdictions and other countries. And this process is whereby you divide out your workplace into different zones with staff allocated to each zone. And you then minimize the movement between zones and um, maintain a log of movement between those zones. Again, this is all around advice in terms of reconfiguring your best workspaces to best comply with the protocol guidelines. On this slide here now, you'll see a live model of what is actually in fact our own offices um, and existing meeting room facilities and how the layout can be reconfigured to ensure social distancing is maintained and the space utilised to facilitate staff return to work. Similarly, on the next slide, that we're looking at here, again, a sample office uh, floor layout. And um, you'll see again, some of the main considerations here, including things like, do we rotate um, staff in overall groups, potentially on a two week in or two week out basis, that we would include measures such as, you know, not including uh, people who are deemed high risk or those living with high risk individuals to attend the workplace. And that we would also obviously ensure that we do a full deep clean um, of the workspace between those rotations. Again, the takeaway message for you today is to get a handle on your own physical workspaces um, at this stage in the context of complying with that protocol to clearly see what is and isn't possible within your own four walls. But again, using this sample office floor layout plan, we can see that the capacity on the floor has been reduced from what was a 75 person um, floor approximately 23 people. So again, we can see that there are going to be significant challenges in terms of re returning to a full capacity um, scenario. Looking now and turning to look at the health and safety considerations, protecting health and safety of employees and others in the workplace remains paramount. And as my advice to employers today, um, in conjunction with uh, the return to work safety protocol, will be to keep up to date with the latest public health guidelines, um, and to communicate these to employees, also to keep abreast of the developments from the Health and Safety Authority website, which is being updated very regularly. But all employers, as Derek said earlier, must now conduct a risk assessment before any return to the workplace um, is, is envisaged. And that assessment should cover the risks posed by both the premises, by the working conditions, and also the composition of the workplace. And you should focus as employers on reducing the risk of physical contact. So you may look at introducing a no handshaking policy, introducing additional um, and heightened cleaning rotas, organizing your teams um, you know, into groups who consistently work together and can take their breaks together, and also staggering working hours to reduce the volume of staff congregating at the beginning or end of the day. You will also potentially encounter situations where some employees may not want to return to work due to caring responsibilities or for health reasons and concerns. And consideration should be given as to whether or not these employees can continue to work from home effectively um, or whether or not they remain on, on a series of leave or layoff. Employers should consider um, the working, for, working hours and working arrangements. So this may include ways to limit the number of people commuting at peak travel hours and staggering start and end times to minimise the risk of infection. And again, Mary uh, from TransDev is going to speak to us a little bit um, later around the, the, um, the measures that the Lewis have introduced in terms of um, infection control, etc. Employers must remain abreast of the um, latest guidelines for the use of uh, PPE. And where PPE is required, that there is adequate stores and uh, availability of that for all employees as well. Employers must put in place practical measures to support those who are um, on site. Um, and these measures would include hand washing facilities, additional hand sanitizer stations, 
antibacterial wipes, appropriate signage, and that you are checking and restocking um, these items regularly as well. Under the return to work safety um, protocol, employers must develop the COVID-19 response plan, which is the plan in the event that there is uh, an employee who contracts or has a suspected case of COVID-19. Um, so this is a plan that you must develop um, and that it outlines a procedure that would be followed in the event that such an eventuality uh, were to occur. And finally, the COVID compliance officer um, is a new role. So under the protocol, you must appoint at least one clearly identifiable lead representative who will be charged with ensuring that the COVID-19 measures are strictly adhered to in the place of work. Any individual who is undertaking this role must receive the necessary training and have a structured framework to follow within the organization to be effective in preventing the spread of the virus. This is a role that many organizations are using um, external or outsourced assistance with, and it is a service that we at Mazars are providing. So if you are interested in learning more, please do not hesitate to reach out to Dara or myself. Turning now just to, I suppose, from a people and staff perspective, the considerations here that employers need to be mindful of really focus around the important role of effective communication for all in this period of a significant uncertainty. So employees should be regularly updated on the developments and progress of the return to work arrangements and an open door policy be implemented to enable employees to air any concerns they may have. As part of the reorientation stage prior to returning to work, all employees must complete a pre-return to work form, um, which must be completed at least three days in advance of returning to work. You must also, as an employer, appoint and train at least a, one training champion per department, uh, which would be a role that um, ensures that at departmental level, employees are continuing to be um, cooperative uh, with the revised working arrangements. And finally, in relation to employee supports, many employees may be suffering from fear and anxiety at this time um, and indeed in relation to returning to the workplace. So employers should ensure that they have an adequate employee assistance program in place to support employees. On the next slide here, there's a sample implementation plan for an organization, which includes the mix of typical considerations affecting all employees and employers. And this may well be a, a helpful plan for you to um, reflect on for your own given instances, um, because you'll see here the typical considerations such as travel policies, uh, facilities and use of uh, public lists, etc. Finally now, just looking, I suppose, at the fourth and final category of considerations, and this is grouped under the other category, where I have coupled together some of the issues to remain mindful of as employers when following and implementing the return to work safety protocol. So firstly, in relation to public liability insurance, I would urge all employers who are considering reopening their businesses to discuss the matter with their public liability insurance provider to ensure that adequate cover is in place. From the perspective of public transport, um, a significant number of employees will, re be, will require um, public transport um, in order to return to the workplace. And as I said, Mary Egan from Transdev will be sharing with us in a few moments some of the steps that the Lewis has introduced to reduce the risk of exposure to the virus. And also, we all remain at risk of a second wave of infection. Um, and obviously, this is a, a risk that affects us all, but as employers, I would urge you to ensure that you have your remote working frameworks on standby um, in the event of a second lockdown. And finally, from a HR policy perspective, your policies and existing suite of policies uh, need to remain under review and be updated in line with any changes. The um, initial policies that you should immediately review include um, your sick leave policy, your annual leave policy, and also your working from home policy. But my advice would be to clearly um, communicate early with employees on any policy changes um, and ensure that that communication is, is made available publicly. So this brings us to the end of today's webinar presentation. And I'm going to pass you back now to Cleona for an opportunity for some questions and answers. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Dara and Sonia, for those very insightful presentations. And now I'm going to invite also Miri Egan, who is the HR Director of Transdev, to join us on the panel discussion. And perhaps, Miri, if you can put on your, um, your video. Great. Morning, Miri. Thank you very Hi, much. Hi, Gina. How are you? 
Fine, thank you. And I imagine you're an extremely busy person right now, uh, keeping the Lewis up and running for us all. So just to start off, maybe you can talk to us about what Transdev have done for their employees and planning for the next normal, Mary. Okay, well, thanks for having me, Cleona. Um, I'm actually very proud listening to Dara and Sonia that in Transdev, we have been very proactive in many ways to assist our employees in the ongoing changes in the workplace as a result of COVID-19. Every day, our senior management team have calls with the National Transport Authority and with other major transport companies to get updates in line with government guidelines as to what needs to happen in relation to the transport sector. Also within our business, every day managers from every department um, have a call so that everybody is across the business and are aligned to the updates as to what's happening within each department. Because as I think Sonia mentioned there earlier, communication is key, especially during this crisis. We've also, our safety department have been very busy and have conducted an assessment on all our frontline critical roles and provided appropriate PPE. So example like masks and gloves and hand sanitizing. And also if you visit any of our three um, sites, you will see yellow signage everywhere within our buildings in relation to COVID. So again, communicating to our employees about proper hand cleaning and sanitizing and social distancing, etc. We've also received a large support from our IT department um, because as most of us are now uh, working remotely, um, this was a new concept for a lot of people. So IT were very busy as regards getting us set up remotely in our homes and also we're uh, continuously having tutorials on the different systems that we use. So example, Zoom and Teams, because as we work through this, we still need to have engagements with our employees. We still need to have meetings and we are all now becoming experts on these platforms. Um, we've also engaged with our company medical practitioner who is very familiar with our employees in relation to any underlying health um, conditions that they may have. But he's also been a great support because, as you know, um, GPs, can, a lot of what they can do at the moment is just consultations over the phone. So our company medical practitioner is also there to supply supply support to them and to us as to what's the best thing to do in relation to our employees because our the safety of our employees is very important to us. We've also promoted our employee assistance program for all our employees because as we are in very unusual and uncertain times for everyone um, everybody deals with it in different ways and people are going through you know pressures at home, maybe home schooling, not able to get children minded, maybe um, financially. And we have seen an increase in the uptake of people using our employee um, assistance program, which is, is good to hear. And also just from listening to Dara and um, Sonia, we've also um, had to change procedures and policies. So like um, I think it was Sonia mentioned about the return to work um, form, we've, all, we've already um, changed ours and we have that actively in place. We're also um, guiding our supervisors as to how to deal with employees as they return to work um, due to absence with uh, COVID related absence. Thank you, Mary. And with all this experience on the ground, um, what challenges do you foresee in the workplace as people return to work? Well, as people return to work, a bit like what um, Sonia was speaking about there, the first thing is as people come back to the offices, um, like many organisations around the country, we don't have um, big um, facilities for people. Like Sonia pointed out there that in a meeting room that usually facilitates 12, now there's only two. So um, these are things that we are looking at at the moment. Also, we have people who, um, in their current role, for example, we have customer assurance officers who we are looking at and have looked at their roles. And at the moment, they're doing more social distancing um, guidelines for our customers and platforms. So we had to train our employees on how to perform this in a safe manner. So training had to be done in small groups at social distancing. 
So that's a change. And also we have people maybe who are out on the front line who for medical reasons, it's not safe to have them there. So we're looking at other roles that maybe we have um, that they can do remotely or that they can do in an office. And again, we're looking at retraining. Also as um, the different phases progress, um, like, like every other organization, as creches open or remain closed for another while, as children return to school, and from what we're hearing at the moment, children might be going back to school just for um, on a part-time basis, that will also cause concern for our employees. Um, so we are starting to look at how would we manage that in relation to their rosters and trying to facilitate employees going forward. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. And um, what we'll do now is we have a few minutes to look at other questions that are coming in from our participants. Um, I have one question here. Uh, this is for Dara. Dara stated that if you are bringing uh, staff back before August the 10th, you will need to carry out a risk assessment. So does this mean, Dara, that if you are not bringing back staff until that date, that there is no need to carry out such a risk assessment? <laughs> No, so I, I didn't express that correctly, if that's what I came across. You, you need to conduct a risk assessment anyway. That's provided for in the protocol. Uh, I suppose what I'm talking about is doing it a little bit earlier in the event that you're going to, in the event that you fall into category five and you're planning to bring back staff in any great numbers before the category, the phase five provision, i.e. the 10th of August. But you'll need to do a risk assessment anyway, because even as Mary said, every organization is different. You you know, there's different layouts of rooms. You'll have you, you'll need to find out, for example, how many medically vulnerable staff do I have? How many pregnant people do I have? How am I going to deal with them? Um, there's a whole series of physical policy and other types of risk that you need to uh, look at early on. It's just that you need to factor in the additional element of being slightly ahead of the phase you're supposed to be in if you go before the 10th of August. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dara. I come to another question. Um, thank you for your presentation. The content is very focused on office workers. My company has commercial workers that are calling to pharmacies. They cannot perform some of their duties working from home. Are there other specific considerations not mentioned in the document that I should keep in mind? They will be back on the field on the 8th of June. Thank you for, uh, for your answer. I might just cover that one. So I think the principles are the same. You're right. We have we have probably focused a little bit on office workers. Um, the principles are the same. So the protocol applies to all categories of staff. So you still have to come up with a plan and you have to address how those types of um, employees should uh, comply with the protocol. So you still have to think about hand hygiene, but maybe in a different fashion. You still have to think about respiratory hygiene, but maybe in a different fashion. You still have to think about physical distancing in the context of how they do their, their do their jobs. Um, so there is a provision actually in the protocol for customer facing roles. I, that's probably the kind of role you're talking about there. I would suggest the best thing to do is have a look at the customer facing element of the protocol. That would probably help you because um, it's an additional provision on top of the stuff we've talked about today. Thank you very much, Dara. Now, I think we have probably time for one or two more questions, if I'm correct. So I'll just take uh, this one here, which is, when will there be clarification around the one metre or two metre social distancing? Has anybody a magic wand on that one? <laughs> I think that, I think Tony Holden came out yesterday and said he wasn't planning on changing it for the moment. That's probably all the clarification we have. I think it was yesterday or the day before. He came out and said, um, Dr. Tony Holden, it's it's two for now. That's what, kind of what he said. So I think you have to go with two unless it's something else is said. Like everything is being driven by the advice of NFET. So the government are only going to change something if they if they are advised to do so. And at the moment, it's not the case. So I think it's probably safer to plan for two and then great. If one comes into place, pull it back. <laughs> but for now, it's two. Thank you. So maybe we'll move on to a final question. And it, it actually, I'm quite interested in the answer to this one. Any particular advice re shared workspace arrangements such as we work? If anybody would like to take that. Yeah, so I suppose it, I can, I, I won't comment on we work exactly, but I suppose in any, um, any office environment where there's a shared working, um, you know, where I suppose um, open plan office facility, the advice is really as per the protocol, you know, it's to look at measures that are required in those environments, reduce 
um, and to ensure that social distancing can be maintained. So as we said, maybe uh, removing every second chair, um, Fiona, um, you know, issues like um, ensuring that you're you're grouping people in teams together, people who work together frequently um, are kept together, that the breaks are kept together, and then also obviously increasing your cleaning um, rotas as well, alongside all of the usual um, issues around, you know, um, providing of hand sanitizers um, and, uh, you know, labelling and, and signage, etc. Okay, so uh, I would say if we work to just add to that, and I don't know if any organization is providing a service such as we work or any 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 place, they have to comply with the protocol. So if you're if you're purchasing space or renting space in a in any environment and it's being provided by somebody else, then the somebody else, whoever that might be, has to comply with the protocol. So hopefully they would be coming to whoever the person renting the space is and um with the solution because they're the ones providing the service, I, I would say. I would hope. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think uh, we have uh, several questions. I don't know, how are we doing for time? Can anybody, the organiser, let me know? Can we continue? Yeah, or? It's, just, it's just 10 to 11 now there, Cleona. Okay. We can cover so a couple more if you'd like to. Yeah. Cover a couple more. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I have a question here. Um, can an employee refuse to return to the workplace? So, yeah, great. Okay. Um, so I suppose in, in short, the answer to this is a little bit, um, as I referred to earlier, the importance around communication, communication, communication. Okay. Um, obviously, you're going to need to work with your employees. Um, you know, and, and to ensure that you are, um, you know, understanding any uh, issues and potential issues that may exist around the refusal to return to a workplace. Um, but in short, there is a, I suppose it's, it's a yes if there is a genuine concern, okay? Um, but as a, we all know under the, both the common law duty of care from an employer's perspective and also the, um, the health, Safety, Health and Welfare at Work Act 2005, the list of duties there that are included from an employer perspective, if the employer has fulfilled all of those particular duties in terms of providing a safe um, place of work that is free from hazard, um, you know, that is, I suppose, the, the, the standard to which um, it is, you know, we're all being um, upheld to, if you like. Okay, so I think in, in, in short, you know, it's trying to work with people to bring people back into the workplace um, and to get to the bottom of any of those concerns that might exist. Just as Mary had referred to there as well, it's about looking at, you know, what are the reasonable alternatives um, that could be um, addressed and can be uh, looked at. You know, if there's people who have genuine health concerns, um, or, or at risk to their health. It's obviously a very had illustrated there with a very live example from the Fansdev experience, you know, looking at suitable alternatives um, that might exist, you know, be it moving to office-based roles or alternative roles. Yeah. And I, if I can just add to that, Sonia, like we have seen yeah. people return to work, but we also do have people who have underlining health concerns. And that's where our company medical practitioner has come in and has been a great support to them in trying to guide them through, you know, in them making a decision as to whether they feel it's safe to come back or not. But and yeah. also then they it really is they we do encourage them to keep in touch with their GP because at the end of the day, their GP knows best. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I have another question here. here. Uh, thanks for an excellent presentation. How are Mazars or Transdev encouraging engagement with colleagues to address isolation issues or the risk of presenteeism, that is for staff who are not turning off from the working week? Turning off, turning off, yeah. Okay. Off, so yeah. on the assumption that that hasn't been asked by somebody in Mazars, I'll answer that one. Um, so, how are we how are we dealing with? Uh, it's a it's a regular question because it's a it's a live risk. So, we are doing a couple of things, I suppose, in terms of the isolation thing. So, first of all, every single department has broken into teams, and every team has at least two or three uh, video meetings a week. So, take Sonia's team; she can see her team a couple times a week, and she'll know if anybody's in their pajamas or not feeling well, or whatever the case may be. Are not turning up, um, so the, the first one is the physical one. We also have we've done a couple of other things. We have we've identified people who are who are concerned about and HR are monitoring those and engaging with them. We also every morning when we log in, we get uh, what we're calling the daily do, 
and it has three sections in it. It's kind of an email from HR, which is really helpful. It has activities in relation to physical well-being, in relation to mental well-being, in relation to social well-being, and it's suggestions and activities. So it, you know, it could be something like, you know, here's a link to um, an online yoga thing, or why don't you ring a colleague today, or whatever it is. It's it's quite it's quite good, um, and it's 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 much more substantial at the weekend. So it's providing lists of suggested activities to do and online things to do, even for children. So it's good for your families. We're also doing things like we've done a couple of quiz nights where uh, the office in general and is, is you know grouped into teams and people can engage um, instead of you know going and doing a, a social activity with work. Um, so a variety of a variety of different things um, in the social isolation uh, thing space, I suppose. And in terms of people not switching off, look, I think that's a general risk anyway. In terms of people not switching off. Um, we are um, our executive. I'm in the executive. We get we get a list every day of of who's logged in and how long they've logged in for. So you can see the people that are online for 22 hours or 90 hours or whatever it might be. So if there's any concerns in that respect, um, their managers are being spoken to, and then the manager has, you know talks to them and kind of links in with them. So we're, we're monitoring it quite significantly because we're aware of both ends of the of the spectrum. We're also encouraging people, it's hard to take holidays at the moment, but we're encouraging people to take a couple of days off or take a break, even if it's just to go out in the garden and, or, you know, do, just switch open a bit. Um, because it's hard to sit in front of a, a computer all day when you can't get up and have a chat with somebody. So uh, any other suggestions, we're happy to take them on board. And so and just Mary, to follow on, were, yeah, sorry, just to follow on there from Dara, because we're doing um, a lot of similar things to what Dara mentioned. But also because um, we have people who are working from home and maybe their partner is working from home and they're trying to juggle children, um, it is easier for them maybe to stagger their hours. So we do have people maybe who start work earlier, maybe finish at lunchtime and then they might do a few hours in the evening, whatever suits them in order to try and get their work done. And because we only went through a restructure towards the end of last year, like we have a lot of new line managers who are now trying to manage teams remotely. So we're trying to guide them as to how to do that because it is difficult under the circumstances. And like Dara said, to do weekly calls, weekly Zoom or Teams meetings, it is good to, to see the faces and keep the contact up. Okay. okay, thank you very much. I have another very interesting question here, which is a concern for many, where someone is working from home but can't source childcare. Where does the company stand vis-a-vis -vis visibility of this continuing? I don't know who wants to take that one. Does the company stand as in where does Mazar stand? Well, well, I can say from our perspective is we're looking at every case case by case. So we're 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 trying to engage with each person and say, right, what works for you and how can you adapt it? Uh, adapt and how can we adapt to assist? We've also um, put in place a policy, a new policy that was issued a couple of weeks ago which was people with caring responsibilities. And it's, it's a specific set of options. So it's a specific menu of options that has gone out to everybody to say, look, if you are struggling with caring, and it might not, might not just be children, it might be you know parents who are cocooning or something like that, uh, or somebody with an underlying health condition, these are the options that are available to you. So there's a menu of options. So it's everything from flexible working to taking some more time off to taking a break in the summer uh, and, and a range of other things. Um, we've also done an, an employee survey. We've done a couple, actually, two. One was a mental health one, and this other one was a, a kind of a what you need in terms of supports one. And 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 some of these policies and measures are 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 arising as a result of those surveys. And we're going to keep doing those to make sure we're kind of switched on to what people need. Hopefully, that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so. In fact, we're getting a lot of questions in and we don't have the time to go through all of them. But I think uh, one question has popped up a few times. Everyone's saying thanks for the excellent presentations. Is there any way to get a copy of the deck of slides? Yeah, sure, we can send them around, yeah. Great. I think we'll arrange also to get them to our members and all of our Mazars clients who are joining us today. So I would like to say un grand merci to our wonderful panel of speakers. Thank you to the Mazars team, Dara and Sonia. And also thank you to Miri for, for telling us about the experience with TransDev and on the Lewis. I'd also like to thank everybody working behind the scenes, including Nicola and Leah from the France Ireland Chamber of Commerce team, and uh, Josephine and everybody involved from the technical point 
for the webinar. Um, and just to let you know that next up, we are going to have an effort meeting with our MEP Barry Andrews speaking on Thursday the 4th of June. We've also issued a second part of our survey to FICC members to let us know how are you getting on. We did a survey at the beginning of March and we are now looking at best practice for the phase that we are in now. So, uh, without further ado, I would like to say thank you very much everyone for joining us. Thank you for those who joined us and we hope you found it useful and we will be following up with the presentation slides. Merci beaucoup et à bientôt. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.